everyone. Uh, I am Amir Licht from IDC Ertzalia in Israel, and uh, my, uh, with me is my co-chair in this Spotlight Series event, Tom Voss from KU Leuven. Also together with us are Elaine McPartland and Vanessa Koenig from uh, ECGI. <clears throat> Without their endless energy, uh, this event would not have been possible, so I would like to thank Elaine in particular and Vanessa on behalf of all of us. Um, just a few words of introduction. I mean, little needs to be said about the importance of uh, the subject of today's event, right? Uh, about the purpose of the corporation. Uh, one of the reasons why we shouldn't say too much is uh, because this subject has been debated, adjudicated, even legislated uh, for decades now. And just last week, uh, we marked the 50th anniversary of Milton Friedman's famous article the uh, seminal decision in Dodge v. Ford was handed down more than 100 years ago in 1919. And uh, my favorite actually uh, comes from 1883, that's it, 1883, uh, when Judge Fry in Hutton versus West Cork Railway said, I'm quoting, a railway company or the directors of the company might send down all the porters at a railway station to have tea in the country at the expense of the company. Why should they not? It is for the directors to judge. The law does not say that there are to be no cakes and ale, but there are to be no cakes and ale except such as are required for the benefit of the company. So this insight uh, or position has been with us for a long time. Uh, nevertheless, the purpose or the objective of the corporation today is as hotly debated as ever. Against this backdrop, we have a distinguished speaker and a stellar roster of panelists who will enlighten us about it. Uh, Tom, over to you. Thank you, Amir. Uh, let me just start by saying a few words about the structure of our one hour meeting. Um, so first, Professor Rock will start by presenting his paper for 15 to 20 minutes. And then we have our panelists who will give their comments, each also for five to seven minutes. Then if, we have if time permits, we will have a session of Q&A and further responses. So the participants uh, in this webinar can indicate via the Q&A box if they have a question and we'll get to them at the end of uh, our session. Um, the order of the speakers is as follows. So we'll start, start with Professor Ed Rock from NYU Law School. Then we'll have a comments by Mr. Leo Strine, former Chief Justice of the Delaware Supreme Court and now of counsel at Wachtell. Then we'll have uh, Dr. Herman Dams, Chair of the Board of BNP Paribas Fortis, a Professor Emeritus at the Faculty of Economics and Business at uh, the KU Leuven, and also a representative member of ECGI. Then we have Professor René Adams, uh, Said Business School at the University of Oxford. We uh, also have Professor Guido Ferrarini, who is a Professor of Law at the University of Genoa. And then finally, we have Professor Stephen Davidoff Solomon um, from the University of California, Berkeley uh, School of Law. Law. Uh, we're now happy to have Professor Rock uh, present his paper. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen so I can show you some slides. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and a great pleasure to talk about this topic. And uh, Amir framed it very nicely because this is a very old topic and yet it's all over the news. Uh, hold on, let me, let me see if I can move. There we go. Uh, Larry Fink got the modern debate perhaps going in his, in his letter to CEOs, A Sense of Purpose. The Business Roundtable in 2019 came out with its statement on the purpose of a corporation. Davos, uh, the World Economic Forum has jumped on board. Uh, Marty Lipton has put out uh, memos and has developed what he calls the new paradigm. Colin Mayer has written a very well regarded and excellent book on prosperity arguing for corporate purpose. Uh, and most recently, the EU has come out with its report with EY on director's duties, which embraces this notion of corporate purpose and indeed proposes a variety of both soft and uh, and hard changes, including, interestingly, a prohibition, a uh, proposal to amend the transparency directive to prohibit both earning guidance and quarterly reporting for listed companies. So a lot is going on here. And the question that this paper addresses is trying to make sense of this debate. It's really an exercise in conceptual analysis. It's an exercise in clarifying what the debate is about 
so that hopefully we can make some progress in a debate that often seems like people are working at and talking at cross purposes. And I argue in the paper that this is at least four different intersecting discussions. There's a legal discussion. What does the law permit or require? What is the best description of the corporation as an enterprise form? Because of course, there are a lot of different enterprise forms and the corporate form in its current, uh, current design, in many ways traces back to the 1880s, 1870s and hasn't changed significantly since then. Uh, and one of the key questions that a business planner has uh, when an entrepreneur is considering how to organize a new business and comes into the business planner needs to know what, it, what are the characteristics of the corporate form as compared to an LLC, a benefit corporation, a limited partnership, or a general partnership. There's a second debate, a, finan a finance debate that's raging in the finance uh, and business school world, which is how to think about the firm both from a theoretical perspective and modeling it and from an empirical perspective. There's a management debate also raging in the business schools and spilling over, which is how to build successful companies. And finally, what gives this so much energy is there's a political debate. What are the social responsibilities of large business entities? And can corporate governance substitute for political gridlock and dysfunction in dealing with the most pressing issues of the day like sustainability? And what makes this so confusing to me is that often the participants don't make clear which debate they're intervening in. And moreover, these debates play out differently in different countries. So let me give you a quick, quick summary of what I argue in the paper as to my preliminary answers. And I, the big conceptual contribution of this paper, the big move in the paper is the conceptual analysis. My answers to the particular questions are much less definite and my view, but I, I'm, what I'm really committed to is the conceptual structure that I'm, I'm offering here. On the law question, I view the question of the objective of the corporation as best understood as a question about the characteristics of the corporate form that has existed more or less unchanged since the 1870s and 1880s, and how it differs from other enterprise forms that are used to organize business activities. And that allows us to, a, to ask questions like, what is the best enterprise form for purpose-driven businesses? In the US and the UK, I think shareholder primacy broadly defined, what sometimes is called enlightened shareholder primacy, is an accurate description of the default settings. Only the default settings, because you can change the default settings in just about any system. Now, is this an accurate description in Germany and other countries with co-determination? No, and that's why this debate inevitably has very much a local flavor. And my paper is very much written from the American perspective. On the finance debate, I spend a lot of time chatting with finance uh, professors. Uh, shareholder primacy clearly is still generally accepted as an approximately accurate description of what firms in the US and the UK actually do. I'm curious, it's an interesting question whether that's also true in systems with co-determination. On the management side, the management debate, what makes this whole debate so interesting is that shareholder primacy is a terrible management strategy in most contexts because the task of management is to get everybody working together to pull in a common direction and to build a great com company. And going on and on, saying we're doing this only for the benefit of the shareholders is a terrible way to get employees invested in the business, to get customers, to get suppliers invested in the business. And clearly in managing a firm, firms have to look at st st stakeholders and, and, and treat them well if they want to be successful. There are times, of course, when shareholder primacy is exactly the management lever Needed. And here I'm thinking of private equity driven turnarounds where the company has gone astray and the private equity firm comes in and using a combination of high powered equity incentives combined with high powered monitoring work to turn the company around. Finally, in politics, the debate is, is truly fascinating. Clearly, large business entities have social responsibilities. I don't think anybody can deny that. Moreover, I think equally clearly, Shareholder primacy is not a winning political strategy. 
and explicit concern for stakeholders, a la the, the business roundtable statement or Marty Lipton's new paradigm. It may be, and here is where I think the politics get really interesting, it may be a winning strategy in the sense that it may forestall intrusive mandatory corporate governance regulation. That's one view. And it may be a losing strategy in the sense of paving the way, in fact, for intrusive mandatory corporate governance regulation. And that's the Milton Friedman argument from the 1970 famous article. That's what he was mostly worried about, is that the corporate embrace of, of social responsibility undermined the political legitimacy of capitalism and thus threatened, threatened corporate, uh, corporate productivity. Now, analytically and conceptually, what makes this so interesting, of course, is that the best answers to the law question or the finance question may be different than the best answers to the management or the politics question. And how those answers intersect is where I think a lot of the complexity lies. There's a second conceptual move that I'm making in this paper and in, in an accompanying paper for a, a handbook on corporate purpose. And here the conceptual claim is that I want to draw a distinction between business purpose and corporate objective. Business purpose is a management concept and you can define it as a concrete goal or objective for the firm that reaches beyond profit maximization. A, that's a management concept. And it can exist in a corporation or in an LLC or in a master limited partnership or in a benefit corporation or in a general partnership and so forth. It's not specific to any particular organizational form. And I want to draw a distinction between corporate, between business purpose and corporate objective or partnership objective or LLC objective, which relates to the enterprise form. And from this perspective, the oft used phrase corporate purpose is both deeply ambiguous and very confusing. Sometimes it's used as a synonym for business purpose. That's how Colin Mayer uses it. He's not actually interested in the difference between being organized as a corporation or being organized as an LLC or an LLP or whatever. It's also sometimes used as a synonym for what I'm calling corporate objective, a description of the characteristics of the corporate form. And buried in this perhaps confusion is a move, is a political, small p political move. It's the idea that defining or redefining the corporate objective, the characteristics of the corporate form to embrace greater attention to stakeholder interests will push management and investors to give greater attention to stakeholder interests. That is to say there's a reform aspect to much of the debate about how to properly characterize the corporate objective. And there's another interesting question that emerges here, which is, does it make sense to entrench a particular business purpose in a corporation's constitutive documents in a certificate of incorporation or articles? And if so, how best to do so? And this is a topic that Steve Davidoff and Jill Fish are working on. So why do I think that the best description of the corporate objective is, uh, is shareholder primacy? Well, this is my attempt to, to describe that. And this is very much the traditional view. The objective of a corporation is to promote the value of the corporation for the benefit of the shareholders within the boundaries set by law. In doing so, a corporation may consider the various interests of stakeholders. Now, this is something I've drafted to present to first the advisors and ultimately the Council of the American Law Institute as part of the new restatement of corporate governance project that I'm heading up. And this is, this is more or less the traditional view of corporate objective. And I think it was true in the 1880s in the, in the case that uh, Amir cites to, I think it was true in the 1920s and 1930s. I think it was true in the 1980s when the principles of corporate governance, the predecessor to this project came out. And I think it's true today. I think it's an accurate description of the enterprise form. And the key elements are the, the ultimate, not the proximate, but the ultimate beneficiaries of the shareholders. The firm must operate within the boundaries of the law. There's huge flexibility during normal midstream management to take into account the interests 
of other stakeholders, and that's protected by the business judgment rule, so long as there is some rational connection with shareholder benefit. And there are limitations that come in at boundary cases, at endgame, the sale of the company with respect to wholly owned subsidiaries, and where there are conflicts between stockholders, preferred stockholders, or credit. Now that's, that's a restatement in my mind of the traditional religion. Now, why do I think that Delaware, that my draft 2.01 restates Delaware law? That's a long discussion. It's in the paper. Leo Strine has written extensively on this. The, the case, it seems to me, is overwhelming that as a descriptive matter, this is accurate. I don't want to go through the details at this point. So let's now turn to the finance piece of this debate. And I was on a panel with Wei Zhang a while Ed, back. On, Ed, Ed, three yes. minutes. Three okay. minutes. Good. Three minutes? Yep. Said 20 minutes. Um, okay, let me skip the finance debate and move on to the management debate. Um, should the business roundtable change how managers manage the firm? Well, probably not, because they already don't manage for Pure, purely for the shareholders. As Jack Welch said, it's an insane strategy. Now, is there a problem in business schools? There are those who argue that generations of MBAs have been miseducated into the idea that they should maximize shareholder value at every moment of every day. The law does not require them. Treating stakeholders well or pursuing business purpose as a way to build great companies is entirely consistent with the consistent with the traditional view of shareholder primacy. So let's now close with a few words about the, the politics. Um, now the argument clearly is that, that corporations now are the focus of sustained political attention. Elizabeth Warren has focused on the Marco Rubio, the EU report. Um, one analysis of the politics is that shareholder primacy is simply gone. And if we don't adopt the new paradigm or the equivalent, we'll get restrictive legislation and restrictive legislation is a threat on this view to investors and to companies. Now the counter argument is the argument I made before, which is that it may pave the way to restrictive legislation. Imagine if you will, Elizabeth Warren ending up as secretary of the treasury. And in, uh, in August say of 2021, she says, look, in 2019, the Business Roundtable came out with its nice statement, and I sent them a letter saying, how are you going to accomplish this? They never responded to my letter. And now we're two years beyond that, and nothing's changed. Clearly, it's time to embrace my Accountable Capitalism Act. And that's the sense in which Milton Friedman worried about this direction. So for those who want to argue that we should change the traditional answer to the law question in order to change how firms operate, the management question, increase firms' legitimacy, the politics question, and avoid intrusive mandatory regulation. There seems to be at least three key questions that have to be answered. The first is, is would changing our answer to the law question actually change how firms operate, the management question? increase firms' legitimacy, the politics question, and prevent management regulation? Would it? Relatedly, would not changing our answer to what I view as a fairly technical legal question lead to intrusive legislation? I don't know. And finally, what harm would flow from changing the answer to the law question to some version of the business roundtable? And here, I close with, with a, a, an observation about corporate law in general. Corporate law sits at the intersection between public law and private law. And different corporate law scholars are more in the public law setting and more or more in the private law setting. I come to corporate law as a private, as a private lawyer. And the, 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 the beauty of corporate law is that it provides a set of rules that business folks can avail themselves of to organize their affairs. And from that perspective, a key function is to define the menu of enterprise forms carefully and clearly so that businessmen, businesswomen can choose which form they want. And these are 
These are forms that allow for making credible corporate commitments. It's been wildly successful in creating successful businesses. And the private lawyer worries that if you ask corporate law to do too much, change how management occurs, preserve the, the, the political legitimacy of capitalism, you'll end up not doing much of anything at all. And let me close there. Thank you, Amir. Um, thank you. Uh, we'll now turn to our uh, panelists by the order that Tom uh, specified. Um, Leo Strine first, please, Leo. Thank you, and it's good to be with you. I need to say something because I'm in a, such an esteemed academic company, and I get my employers at Penn and Columbia will be upset if I don't say that I'm also I'm a, a senior fellow um, at Penn and Columbia, and um, it's good to be with you all, and, and it's great to be able to talk about a paper by my friend Ed Rock. And I want to start with where I definitely agree with Ed, which is on his description of what the law is. I, I think it's always important. I, Adolf Burley is a hero of mine, George Orwell, Franklin Roosevelt. It's important if you want to change the world to not be delusional about and pretend that it already is what you wish it to be. And so I think you don't have to take, it's always funny to me, Ed, when I read these things about Delaware law and they say, for example, that the Revlon case is dictum. It is not dictum. The holding of the case turns on the rationale that there always has to be a rational relationship to the benefit of stockholders to take other regarding action towards stakeholders. And that when you're selling the corporation, there can't be a rational relations. That's what dictates the outcome of the case. And if you don't believe Leo Strong, you know, Norm Deasy, Bill Chandler, Bill Allen, Travis Laster know a lot about Delaware law. We have actually fairly diverse politics, but we all kind of understand, and we're not saying there isn't a lot of room for managerial discretion, but it ultimately is, and to put it in philosophical terms, the end is the welfare of stockholders within the limits of the law and perhaps some boundaries around ethics. And other stakeholders can be considered instrumentally. That's just the law. And if you don't like, and that's why people, frankly, my friend Marty kind of waxes and wanes a little bit on this sometimes, but he, he understood how powerful Revlon's statement was. That's why he went, you know, pretty bananas about it because he understood the, 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 the impact of that. So I'm, I embrace that positive description. I will say, I'm gonna give a couple of critiques around the paper. Um, and Ed, you're not allowed to change the paper too much because you got me to, I'm going to do something in writing so you can't pull, you know, a, 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 um, a bait and switch on me. But I'm going to start with something around sort of like the American Revolution, um, the end of the Civil War, um, French Revolution. The idea that this started with Larry Fink and the BRT is a little bit amusing. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of Jamie Dimon, I just would say, because we're we in Delaware, that's, he, they're actually our biggest in private sector employer. And so they do a really good job by their people and by the community. So I'm a big fan of Jamie, but, and I'm not questioning either the sincerity of Mr. Fink or Jamie Dimon, but what I'm saying about the American Revolution, French Revolution or Appomattox is, when you kind of give into when you're a powerful thing and you give into some reality, like the king, the British Cornwallis turning over the colonies, or Lee surrendering in Appomattox, you know, you're not the ones who brought about that change. And I, I want to situate this, it, Ed rightly situated his paper in the American context. The Economic Policy Institute has done a lot of good work on this for a long time on the change in gain sharing within capitalism. Sometimes academics, you know, you're snobby, you don't read people like EPI, but you might read Larry Summers and Professor Stansberry, and they have a new 100 page paper out on the uh, isolating the effect of the diminution in worker voice and leverage and the increase in stockholder power over corporations. And they show that there is no way to explain the change in inequality in the US simply by pointing to globalization. 
They isolate a very specific US effect that is pronounced, and that involves a much huger share of the pie being taken by shareholders and top management, and the workers not getting their share of the pie. They also show there's been a plenty of increase in US productivity. No, we're not inventing things like the refrigerator. Sorry, Steve Jobs. You know, sorry that we're not you're not around, but the refrigerator is Professor Gordon shown. Things like the refrigerator, the vacuum cleaner, <laughs> indoor plumbing are more transformational than the latest iteration of the I, uh, you know, iPhone. But there's been plenty of productivity growth. What has shifted most pronouncedly? The the change between what the workers get and what the 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 top managers and shareholders get. And as Ed cites the statistics, even with a growth in things like 401k and others in the US, frankly, that distribution is hugely not equal. The stockholder class is not reflective of the others. And this is a this is where one of the things I take issue with Ed is companies have not been regarding their other stakeholders well, even the institutional investors. The whole phrase, why well, I call for double ESG, and if all of you care about workers, you'll call for it too. They shouldn't be buried in the S. That even the notion, the shift from CSR to ESG reflects the financialization of the debate. The fact that none of those terms explicitly focuses on workers is not coincidental. The fact that people had to have their butts kicked and be shamed into workers taking more salience is not coincidental. And so one of the things I'm saying here is that there's been a movement for a long time out of economic insecurity in the United States, people like Lynn Stout, frankly me, Marty, others on the political left, the whole, the people who founded the Public Benefit Corporation. These are the folks who actually were raising these questions. And I think, before I turn to the international framework, I want to say this about it is Milton Friedman was opposed to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. He vehemently opposed labor unions. He did not favor environmental regulation. He basically didn't embrace the New Deal in any way, shape or form. One of the issues with having the basically the arrow for stockholder, stockholders and the, the market go up over companies and the external power for stockholders, you know, for, for stakeholders going down, is that businesses have actually felt pressure to and use their vast amount of money to pollute the rules of the game, to undermine protections for workers and for the environment. And so political, the, the objective of the corporation and making corporations seek profit um, or have corporate managers risk ouster has an interactive effect on the political process. And there are huge amounts, and this is not so true in Europe and other nations, there's huge amounts of money coming from the corporate sector in the US, and it has come over the last 40 to 50 years to change the rules of the game. And so the part of the pressure, Ed, for internal looking at corporate governance has been a reaction to the fact that corporate money has been so successful in blunting even past legislation like Dodd-Frank um, obstructing it in the regulatory process, McCain, Feingold, um, uh, environmental regulations. Um, and so there's a real feeling that something has to be done within the politics of the corporation itself. I think there's another major gap in your paper, which is the rise of the institutional investor and their much more vocal role. And it's not so much a change in corporate law itself, as a change in the power structure. And these institutions are do put much more pressure on companies than would have been the case in 1970. Finally, I just wanna, and this is a very ECGI pivot. The US is an outlier. And some of the debate in the US, Ed, and I think even if, for your paper to acknowledge this is, you know, our friend Lucian who says it's sort of absurd, the idea of stakeholder capitalism. Well, then I suppose most of the OECD is just an absurdity. And so that we just, you know, in the US, we're just the only non-absurd nation. And then in Scandinavia and Germany and throughout Europe, you are absurd. And even in Australasia, where there's much more stakeholder capacities, and you all have crappy companies. I mean, the, the, in the US, really rich people in the US who buy products from Bavarian motor companies and Scandinavian watches, it's a charitable thing because the really unproductive workers in those socialist places make crappy products 
but American billionaires buy their products. And American institutional investors invest in the companies there, again, as a charitable exercise. Part of what I'm trying to say is, part of why stakeholder stuff sort of seems alien in the United States is that we really don't have a grasp of the world anymore. We don't really understand that in Europe, even when you don't have unions, you have works councils, that the rules of the game to protect other stakeholders have re remained more intact throughout the OECD. And therefore the decline in gain sharing for workers has not been as profound. And that part of what we need to do is restore the structure of the New Deal and our commitment to those things. That will take some of the pressure off of corporate law, but frankly, moving candidly towards a moderate stockholder driven model like the public benefit corporation that puts a little bit of breakage in the system that gives directors a mandatory duty to think about these things. And in the M&A context, gives them the legal requirement to actually care about stakeholders. I think Ed could be a contextually a part of an overall solution that could be quite useful. Thank you, Leo. Um, we're just a bit beyond uh, the time schedule, but, but I think we're doing fine. Uh, Dr. Dems, please. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to participate. Uh, the paper of Professor Rock uh, really impressed me. Uh, I think he made a very comprehensive review of the discussion on the role and responsibilities of corporate boards with respect to the trade-off between profit and purpose. And on the question, whose preferences in the trade-off come first and should carry the most of the weight, the shareholders or the stakeholders? I must say, Ed, that reading your paper, I learned a lot. Let me first clarify what side I, from what side I approached the debate. First of all, I am an academic or I used to be an academic, but over the last 20 years, I have chaired some seven boards of publicly quoted companies, some 13 boards of family firms, and I've also been a board member in hospitals and in cultural organizations. Finally, I've been chair of the Belgian Corporate Governance Committee. But given all that, I want to stress that I am not a legal scholar and I approach corporate governance nearly purely from a management and financial uh, perspective and also a practical perspective, although I must say inspired by theory. And by this description, it sh you should be allowed now to position me in the framework that Professor Rock has used in this paper. So I'm coming much more from what he calls the finance and the managerial side. Let me make a few uh, brief comments. First of all, I agree with Professor Rock that corporate governance cannot, cannot be a substitute for failures in public policies with regards to inequality and climate change. I think that these problems are extremely important but they are collective and truly public issues for which the corporation is not able to step into the shoes of government. Corporates can implement solutions and regulations for these worldwide problems, but they cannot step into the role of public authorities. Local solutions will not provide truly global solutions. Policymakers cannot withdraw from the problems by arguing that corporations will or should solve them. That does not mean that corporations have no social responsibility. To the contrary, corporations should act as responsible citizens. They should treat employees respectfully and well. They should be honest and fair to consume uh, customers. They should deal with suppliers in a fair way and they should make sure that shareholders and financiers get a competitive return on the funding they provide. To sum up, corporations should add value to the communities in which they operate. My second point, I also agree with Ed that legal changes in the corporate form are, I think, not necessary. I believe 
that within the existing legal forms, there is sufficient room for the board to develop a meaningful purpose for the corporation. And that brings me to the third point. Within the constraints mentioned in my point one and two, I feel that the corporation needs to develop a purpose and it needs to develop that for three fundamental reasons. First, and I think uh, both Leo and Ed have referred to it, employees are not very enthusiastic to start working for companies with the only motivation that they have to make shareholders rich. I'm a grandfather. I would not be very proud if I have to tell my grandchildren that I've done in life is to make sure that the Jones family was getting richer. That is not very inspiring. You also cannot give all collaborators because some people say, well, let's give collaborators a meaningful share in profits. I think that works in private equity and in venture capital setting. And that's where it has been uh, put together. Therefore, I think, and I strongly be uh, convinced, in order to manage a modern corporation, you need a purpose. Second point here on the, on, in my third uh, comment, Customers today have probably less trust in corporations that are only driven by profit motivation. As has become clear from the VW case and of some of the pharmaceutical examples. Customers accept that corporations need profits, but they do not want to be taken advantage of. And then my final point here to argue for uh, uh, a purpose for the corporations. Shareholder, shareholders and banks have changed. Some investors do not want to invest in corporations that have no meaningful purpose. Pension funds, university, for a long time being chairman of uh, KU Leuven, I've seen what the process of the students are if they are concerned about about what's happening to the university funds and also specialized funds. And I see here in the bank that the only funds where we are really growing and spectacularly growing are all the funds that we collect for specifically uh, ESG kind of reasons. The same is true with family firms. I encounter a lot of uh, second or third generation family firms and I see there that the families who own the companies want to be much more uh, purpose uh, driven. And then finally, don't forget that banks who provide, at least in Europe, a lot of the credit for the uh, companies no longer are willing or can uh, fund activities that are bad for individuals and for the environment. I give the example for instance, of cigarettes, funding cigarettes, or uh, funding uh, coal mining and things like that. And then I come to my fourth and final point, uh, in my last, uh, my, my before last point. Um, in the current please, corporate form- Dr. Dance, need, please try yeah. to kind of uh, limit your comments. Okay. Yeah. In Thank the you. current corporate forms, there are sufficient barriers to excessive spending because people who advocate um, uh, the, uh, the purpose-driven thing, are, others are ex concerned that there is going to be excessive spending by the corporation. Professor Rock sees two barriers. I see three barriers. Ed mentions the fact that shareholders appoint directors. This indeed is a barrier for excessive spending on purpose-related activities. But one should add that at least in Europe, shareholders of banks have no longer complete freedom to appoint directors and directors must answer to the European Central Bank before being held responsible by the shareholders. Second barrier, also mentioned by Ed, are takeovers. They are barriers indeed, but I see a third barrier which plays a role as well, is that is the cost of capital. Companies that overspend on purpose-related activities, in my mind, will in the end face a higher cost of capital which will refrain the board from overspending on purpose. 
Let me sum up and then I conclude. I strongly encourage firms to seek a corporate purpose for a variety of reasons. First of all, for the fact that they want to be good corporate citizens, attracting young people, keeping customers and shareholders. But I think it's possible to do this within the current legal structures and the current financial markets. Financial markets are strong masters, but they are, in my observation, not straight jackets. So they will allow certain things. My current observation is that in Europe, many firms, not all, I must say, are pursuing a purpose-driven strategy, not for greenwashing reasons, but because they are push pushed by shareholders and society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um... Professor Adams uh, from Oxford University. Go ahead. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me. Uh, unfortunately, Ed skipped the finance debate, uh, so that's where I'm coming from. It's my fault. <laughs> that's all right. Um, so I really enjoyed Ed's paper. I think it brings a lot of clarity to the discussion. And um, if I have one criticism, it is that he is not critical enough of participants' motivations. Um, and let me just say, you know, I've also been sort of puzzled by the recent attention to stakeholders, but my bewilderment comes from a slightly different perspective. So I'm a, a finance scholar and a trained economist. Um, and as an economist, we're conditioned to discuss potential policy recommendations on a topic only after an extensive analysis of the evidence. To be honest, I would not consider the scientific evidence underlying the discussion of corporate purpose to pass a bar. Okay, so um, if you want to recommend changes to the system, uh, you have to demonstrate where the flaws are. I don't currently see the evidence as being, you know, at the level that we would say would justify making recommendations. Um, and so let me just illustrate uh, what I mean by this. So before recommending that directors change for whom they manage the corporation, one should presumably understand for whom they are currently managing it. But almost by construction, finance scholarship is silent on this topic. So let me give you an example. Um, I recently submitted a paper, uh, maybe not so recently, I don't want to blame the current editors, um, but I submitted a paper to the Journal of Finance, which is our premier finance journal. Um, and it was desk rejected because, as the editor said, it is not a finance paper because it does not have firm value on the left-hand side which means it is not a finance paper because I am not analyzing shareholder value. But if finance papers almost by construction do not measure or analyze stakeholder outcomes, how do we even know whether directors are neglecting stakeholders' interests? So in some work I've done with Amir and uh, Lila Sagiv, uh, we examine this question. We ask on whose side are directors when there are conflicts between shareholders and stakeholders? Our findings are completely consistent with Ed's characterization of the leeway directors do have to interpret corporate law. So even in countries that are considered very shareholderist, directors appear to balance the interests of shareholders and stakeholders. So what our work does is it cast doubt on both the premise underlying the current debate that directors do not currently take stakeholders into account as well as on changes in corporate law as a panacea. So our evidence suggests that the law cannot dictate whose side you are on. As we all are, directors are guided by their personal values and the law does not necessarily trump them. So of course, since Amir and my own work, um, we don't have firm performance on the left-hand side, our papers are not considered finance papers. And as a result, you know, due to the nature of sort of disciplinary boundaries, they are rarely, if ever, cited by finance papers. But this takes me back to my point that important policy recommendations should be based on a careful consideration of all the available evidence. Policy recommendations should also recognize the limits of what we know. Of course, there are examples of corporations for which we can tell that directors neglected stakeholders in favor of shareholders. But there are also examples of cases where we can tell directors neglecting shareholders in favor of stakeholders. And as scholars, we know the dangers of generalizing from examples to the population. 
So without generally accepted measures of stakeholder objectives, how can we say directors generally neglect stakeholders? And without generally accepted methods of quantifying trade-offs between multiple objectives, how can we say directors generally neglect stakeholders in favor of shareholders? So of course there are urgent problems that need solving. And of course there are actions that have to be taken to solve them. But we shouldn't just tell others to take actions, we should also take actions ourselves. And I would argue as scholars, we need to get our own house in order so that we are credible when we suggest fixes to important problems. So I guess my main recommendation to Ed is to highlight more forcefully that until the finance discipline broadens its scope, we need to get our own house in it will not be able to make a rigorous case for changes to the corporate form. It will also not play the role that it should in helping to solve important problems. Over to you, Guido. Okay, that was a model, exemplary, uh, yeah, thing with, within the schedule. Thank you very, very much. Um, Professor Ferrarini, please. Yes. Um, so uh, I will limit my comments to a few remarks. Uh, this is a great paper. I agree with much of it. Of course, it's a paper about US law, but I found it extremely interesting, also from the perspective of a European lawyer. As to the comparison with European law, Ed uh, interestingly classifies Germany amongst the constituency jurisdictions, which is true in a way to the extent that Germany follows a pluralistic concept of corporate purpose. However, as recent German scholarship has shown, uh, the practical impact of these definitions is limited. And also German companies, especially the listed ones, have increasingly, increasingly followed in the recent past a shareholder value approach. Other countries in Europe, including mine, Italy, uh, follow a shareholder primacy approach similar to that uh, dominant in Delaware. However, corporate governance codes tend to emphasize the importance of maximizing long-term value. Uh, moreover, the shareholder value approach is now supplemented by ESG considerations in the definition of corporate purpose. What we see in Europe, as in other countries, is an enlargement of corporate purpose to cover environmental and social issues. Uh, significantly, French law was recently amended by the Pacte Loi, which modified the commercial code to specify that companies pursue their own interest subject to sustainability consideration. Uh, Ed is right in arguing that there are at least four perspectives. Uh, the law, finance, management, and politics perspective uh, from which to look at corporate purpose. Uh, to me, the finance approach is interesting, maybe more on the theoretical side, because as Rene explained a while ago, uh, the empirical studies are still uh, lacking. Uh, in the end, and to conclude, Ed follows a traditional approach in which the firm's stakeholders are mainly protected by contract and regulation, while corporate law is oriented to the enhancement of firm value and the definition of director's duties. I share this type of approach. However, I would also emphasize the increasing role of sustainability as a game changer. In my view, more generally, ethics is often the missing link in today's discussion on corporate purpose, while sustainability is key to understanding the ethical constraints to business activities. 
uh, no doubt uh, the regulatory and ethical constraints of sustainability have a clear impact on the way in which corporations are or should be organized and managed. Um, the, re the resulting picture, in my opinion, is one in which stakeholders are taken care by corporation, not only because this is instrumental to long-term value maximization, as argued by shareholder value theories, but also because this complies with a new morality which is widely reflected in international principles, codes, guidelines, and pronouncements. Uh, the reasons why corporations accept or declare to accept uh, these constraints can be found in reputational concerns, uh, shareholders pressure, or moral conviction of the manager. Uh, from our perspective, I think it is interesting to know that firms may behave morally under incentives that are created by the market, by consumers in the product market, or by investors in the capital market. So that in the end, their behavior may be reflected in the financial performance of the firm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ferrarini. Uh, we're perfectly on, on schedule. Stephen, over to you, please. Thanks. I, I won't ruin it, Amir, I promise. Uh, I really, I really want to thank everyone for here, uh, for being here. And I, I really, uh, Ed Rock, again, has done a terrific job of clearing the brush here. And I think there's a lot of brush to be cleared. Um, and I wanted, um, I can't show the slide, but I just want to start by reading uh, recently Vital Farms, a uh, billion dollar company went public in the United States. And um, if you go to its charter, it went public as a PBC, a public benefit corporation. And so we can see what these types of companies are thinking about when they go public and what their alternative purpose is. And uh, Vital Farms purpose is to do anything it can under a Delaware law, which is standard for any uh, for-profit company. And also its alternative purpose is to bring joy to our customers through products and services, as well as bring ethically produced food to the table. Um, so that's their alternative purpose that they're putting forth as measurable and definable under the public benefit corporation law. And I think um, Jill Fish and I have a paper, uh, we look at this and, and we think the law here has very little to do with purpose. Uh, most companies have a broad undefined purpose, even those that try for broader, uh, you get this mush like vital farms and we can go through the other two PVCs if we need to. Um, and so purpose is really unenforceable in the law. And so I think Ed and uh, Professor Strine are really onto something when they say law is, it's, is structural. Um, uh, essentially what you have, if you look at the PBC also, uh, shareholders rule in terms of how they run the company. Uh, and in that case, uh, if we think the PBC or other forms are gonna change something, we're gonna have to change the fundamental structure of how corporations are run, um, which isn't quite the case yet. Um, so I think if, if law uh, really is not doing much here, uh, what's really going on? So I, I, I think um, like Professor Adams, I think Ed should think uh, a lot more about um, what's on the left-hand side here um, and what really are the issues? I think they're twofold, uh, to be honest. One is I think clearing out the brush, what's really going on is what uh, uh, Strine is alluding to, which is allocational issues. Once the corporation makes its profit, who's gonna get it? Is it gonna be the workers, right? The, the blue collar workers, not the elite workers like us who are hiding out in our apartments or houses right now while the working class serves us during lockdown. It's gonna be, uh, who's going to get the allocation, the shareholders or otherwise? Um, and two, um, is really what's going on just greenwashing and a diversion. And I think, uh, again, back to Professor Adams, I think we need to do a lot more work on measurement of, of what's going on. My sense is that when Google or Apple, which are making billions of dollars or tr literally trillions in some cases, and um, uh, are they doing their sort of uh, public purpose, public benefit to sort of say, look here rather than there. Um, it's hard not to think in the absence of law defining things uh, with the traditional structure that we have, 
um, that that's not what's going on. And so I'd encourage Ed to look at those allocational issues. And I thank you very much for uh, having me here today. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, what we'll do in the remaining time is uh, let Ed respond to the comments from the panelists and also I'll try to kind of summarize a number of questions that we got uh, through the chat and Q&A, which if I kind of integrate them together, they basically ask, uh, what's wrong with more legal regulation of the corporate purpose and the corporate objective, uh, whichever perspective you would like to, to address. But people are, are wondering, it, would it be wrong if directors were directed uh, how to direct uh, their corporations? Ed, over to you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to my commentators. These were wonderful comments and I can only touch on, on my responses. It, it, to put a number of things together, Leo's comments, Guido and Herman's comments. One can think about these non-shareholder interests these days primarily in two buckets, I think. There are employee interests, Leo focuses on employee interests, and there are climate change sustainability interests. Those strike me as the two most pressing. And I think the question, the question of institutional design and legislative reform is where for each of these will you get the most bang for your buck? Where is the political capital to be expended to modify the status quo? On the, on the employee side, and it may be that one wants to do both. With respect to the employee interests that Leo does such a good job focusing our attention on, it's an interesting question whether explicit recognition of employee interests in the corporate governance system would be, for instance, the preferred uh, legislative reform to alternatives such as a $15 minimum wage or taking steps to revive the uh, collective bargaining system and to provide additional modes outside of the union sector for collective voice, sort of an American style works council. Now, it would seem to me if you, you if, if I were Rich Trumka, the head of the AFL-CIO, I wouldn't actually be all that enthused by changes in corporate governance because I know, as Leo points out, that it's the end of the day, it's the institutional shareholders and the hedge funds who elect the directors. And so long as the institutional shareholders have a focus primarily on firm performance and share price over the long term, the extent to which even having a board level committee charged with employee looking after employee interests, uh, the extent to which that will change the status quo is limited. Not that it's not valuable, and I think given that human capital is such a critical function for modern corporations, it might well be advisable to have a board committee that's focused on it, but that's not going to solve, that's not by itself gonna give employees a greater share of the surplus. With respect to climate change, Herman joins my, my view in, in, in that it is primarily a public policy issue uh, and that having a social, having the legislature set a social cost of carbon and enforce it is far more effective than having boards take sustainability into account as, as the French reform would have it. The question is how to get there. And I was very cynical about this for a long time. And I, I occasionally uh, spend some time on Nantucket, which is absolutely diligent when it comes to recycling plastic bottles and recycling everything else, even as the plutocrats fly in on their private jets. And I at one point thought that was very hypocritical, which it may well be. Uh, on the other hand, the question is how do people change their views? And the fact that the plutocrats who fly in on their corporate jets are focused on climate change when they're on Nantucket is actually, when you think about it, not a bad step towards building a political consensus towards doing something significant on climate change. And the same can be said for making sustainability a boardroom discussion. 
at the point that boards seriously engage with problems of climate change. It seems to me that we're three quarters of the way towards a political solution to the problem given who sits on corporate boards. And so there it seems to me that there may actually be a synergy between the corporate governance initiative and the political initiative. Rene makes a very good point about the, the finance literature and the extent to which the finance literature assumes not only that the only thing you care about is firm value, but that you measure firm value by share price. And that is indeed a description of it. What's interesting to me about the finance literature is that there's beginning to be empirical evidence that that business purpose matters and matters to things that traditional finance scholars care about, namely corporate performance. And there's really a very interesting paper by Claudine Gartenberg, Andrea Pratt, and George Serafin called Corporate Purpose and Firm Performance that comes forward with some serious empirical evidence that a focus on corporate purpose increases firm performance. But what's so interesting about this evidence is that the driver seems to be middle management. Middle management having a clear statement from senior management as to what the purpose is of the corporation. And if that's what's driving the, the outperformance, then of course tr the traditional model of corporate governance in which the board is looking for long-term shareholder value is completely consistent with that. It's not an argument for putting corporate, for putting business purpose any place that it isn't already. On the, on the, the, the very good questions that came up in the Q&A and that Amir summarized, as to why not have more regulation? Well, partly Americans don't like regulation and I, I have some, some sympathy with that. Partly it's that regulation is, is, a, is a rather crude, uh, crude tool to get businesses to change their performance. And that I think is the strongest argument that, that my friend Marty Lipton in arguing that you need a new paradigm in order to preempt or preclure or prevent mandatory regulation, the argument he makes is that that's gonna actually be bad for both investors and for firms. That much better, in Marty's view, is to, is to give greater discretion, Marty wants to argue, insulation from both courts, legislatures, and uh, shareholders to the board of directors who he thinks will will use that discretion well. Now, lots of people disagree with that. I'm not sure, I don't think I agree with that, uh, but that's the argument and that's the, the, the strong argument for why mandatory regulation like active investors focused on share price maximization, why both of those on the Marty Lipton view are threats to prosperity. And I think, I think Colin Mayer's approach is quite similar, but it's, it's a fair question. And the, the question goes farther because if you decide mandatory regulation is the appropriate direction to go, then you have to decide why. And if you look at Elizabeth Warren's Accountable Capitalism Act, or you look at the proposal that Bernie Sanders had as part of his, his uh, platform in the, in the Democratic primaries, the, the regulation that's proposed, to my eyes, will do much more harm than good and should not be supported. Let me stop there. Thank you all for your, your wonderful comments. Thank, thank you, Ed. Thank you very much. Um, I believe our time is up. Uh, I, this is a one hour seminar. Uh, I would like to thank all the participants, Ed, uh, Leo Strein, uh, Stephen, Herman, Guido, Rene, uh, and again, the ECGI team, Elaine and Vanessa, Tom. Uh, thank you all, all the attendants. Uh, thank you all for being with us. Uh, we hope to see you again in the next ECGI Spotlight event. Uh, it will probably be focusing on finance issues. Uh, finance is important. Uh, stay tuned. Thank you very much.